and greetings from Houston, Texas in the United States. We're all participating in this event from our homes all around the world, and we're grateful to the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies for hosting this online discussion. Um, for our viewers from Ukraine, our primary language of this event will be in English, um, so we, but we still invite you to ask questions. My name is Kimberly St. Julian Varnon. I am a PhD student in history at the University of Pennsylvania, and it is my great pleasure to invite you all to this discussion about the meaning of race and diversity in Ukraine today. This event is organ organized jointly by 10 leading institutions in Ukrainian studies from the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, and three prominent institutions from Ukraine. These include the American Association for Ukrainian Studies, the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC, the Cambridge Ukrainian Studies Institute at Cambridge University, the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, the Chair of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Ottawa, the Kritika Journal and Publishers of Kiev, Ukraine, the Mykola Zyarov Center at the Monash University, the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the United States, the Ukrainian Book Institute of Kiev, Ukraine, the Ukrainian Emerging Leaders Program at Stanford University, the Ukrainian Institute in Kiev, Ukraine, the Ukrainian Institute of London, and the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. Um, for Zoom participants, you can write questions in the Q&A window located at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you would like to join us with your audio and ask questions personally, please use the raise hand option. The raise hand button can also be found at the bottom section of your Zoom window. For our Facebook audience, you can write questions in the comment sections of the live stream post. Please make sure that you only write your questions under the original Facebook post, not under any reshared posts because you won't be able to see them. Um, so in terms of technology, we are relying for technology for this event. So please be aware that technical glitches, interruptions of sound and video are possible. So if that does happen, please bear with us. Um, we have a very tight time schedule for the event and we would appreciate it if all speakers could stay within their allotted time and we'll alert you if necessary. So moving on to the purpose of today. So located at the intersection of East, West, North and South, for centuries, Ukraine has been a meeting place of very different cultures, languages, religions, and peoples who've all lived together. The tragic events of the 20th century and Soviet policies have significantly diminished that diversity. Nevertheless, today the people of Ukraine speak close to 40 languages, belong to many prominent religious denominations, and have over a dozen major ethnic groups. The increasing homogeneity of the Ukrainian citizens has raised the question of the meaning of diversity and race in Ukraine, especially today at the time of a global struggle for racial equality. Some of the issues we seek to address today include who is the other in Ukraine? How is everyday life affected by the notion of otherness, either racial or ethnic otherness? Do gender and sexuality identities conflate with ethnic or racial otherness? What are some of the expressions of discrimination that members of racial and ethnic minorities face in Ukraine today? How can those be overcome? What are some of the examples of productive steps to counteract discrimination in Ukraine on the level of state policy, lawmaking, and other civil society activities? These and other questions are what we hope to address today. Our first speaker of the day is Mr. Yulian Kondor, who is a Ukrainian Roma rights activist who currently works as a project coordinator at the Roma Women's Fund, Chikli. He has studied jurisprudence, international law, and human rights at the National Academy of International Affairs of Ukraine, Central European University, and the University of Tartu. He has kept his academic focus on, that, on minority rights with a particular emphasis on the situation of Roma in Ukraine and in Europe. For the past two years, hate crimes monitoring and prevention has taken up a large part of his professional portfolio, and he has been included in organizing police training, community self-governing activities, and research on these issues. So I happily turn the mic over to Mr. Condor. Uh, thank you, Kimberly, for, intro for the introduction. Uh, many thanks for the organizers uh, bringing together so many bright minds, people with diverse backgrounds, and 
making a very important discussion about uh, today's Ukraine and its uh, its past and its transformations. Uh, so I, uh, I I I have a privilege to be with you today, and uh, just in a moment I will show uh, my presentation. Uh, where you will see some bullet points uh, of my discussion, oh, of my, sorry, presentation. Um, is it visible now? Can you? Yeah. So I will touch upon uh, such areas as Ukraine and its cultural diversity. Uh, I will... Uh, give some uh, examples of what it is now with regard to what is the state of affairs with regard to ethnic policy and multiculturalism as a fundamental um, element for further development of inclusive policies in, in Ukraine. I will also give some uh, examples and certain tendencies will try to describe certain ten tendencies with regard to the situation of Roma and will give you also a short overview over the civil situation of civil society the role of Roma NGOs in the civil society movement uh, international commitments and internal challenges uh, which uh, we behold uh, in our daily work and uh, in Ukraine in general. So uh, speaking about multiculturalism and ethnic policy, um, I would like to say that I would like to stress some somehow quite obvious thing for many, which, which is uh, Ukraine as a country has a variety of national minorities and ethnic groups living on its territory. Uh, it is, I think Ukraine is in a position that enables uh, it to accommodate and develop uh, the concept of multiculturalism that would uh, promote active social interaction and peaceful coexistence for various ethnic groups as well as majority population. Uh, the notion of Ukrainian identity in today's Ukraine uh, can and should be broadened uh, embracing diversity rather than be built on a limited narrative of radical patriotism. And I come here to radical patriotism because of the situation in which the country is. I mean, uh, it is the armed conflict uh, in Ukraine and the aggression of the Russian Federation, which is ongoing. So uh, there, there have been attempts uh, in recent years to develop the uh, concept of the uh, concept of ethnic policy, which was developed by the Ministry of Culture in 2018. And uh, it has to be mentioned that it also received a lot of criticism um, and was not eventually approved by the cabinet of ministers. Uh, the newly established uh, agency, however, on ethnic policy and freedom of conscience, this was established this year, is a new agency that is to uh, uh, further develop this uh, concept and also um, it's, uh, it is, I think I can say, it, but it's, it's like working uh, uh, issues, but uh, there are some intentions, including in this newly established agency to develop the new law on national minorities, which will, um, which will actually have these uh, notions of um, what is ethnic policy, what is the uh, ethnic uh, population of Ukraine, and uh, we'll have some references to, uh, to, uh, to this issue. Uh, speaking about uh, inclusive policies and affirmative uh, programs, affirmative actions, um, there is a number of programs uh, on policy level, such as the strategy on human rights, uh, the gender action plan, the national Roma strategy, integration strategy, 
and uh, many other uh, regional or local uh, initiatives, po actually policies uh, that uh, are adopted. But at the same time, uh, the fact that they are adopted in itself uh, does not constitute the improvement of the situation, uh, but at the same time, it signaled uh, that the state uh, indeed acknowledged that the situation necessitates certain improvement and intervention, which is, I think, a positive tendency that we could highlight. Um, going further, um, I would like to touch upon the uh, situation of Roma. Sorry, Julian, can you actually uh, show the whole sites, not just only in preview mode? Um, you mean the full screen? Focus yeah. slide of focus, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it is it okay now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So speaking about the situation of Roma, um, few things have to be mentioned. Uh, First is that there is no reliable and comprehensive data on the exact numbers, uh, needs, and living conditions of Roma in Ukraine. Uh, estimates uh, suggest that there might there may be between 200,000 and up to 400,000 uh, Roma dispersed across the country, uh, spanning a range of dialects and cultural identities. The human rights issues they face all of the rest of the time substantially in different regions. Roma in general have a long history of discrimination that despite some progress in recent years continues to this day. And uh, Roma community uh, is definitely a not a monolith. And also the Roma population is diverse and living conditions vary significantly between different communities and regions. They nevertheless are disproportionately marginalized in almost every area of their lives, from education and health care to housing and employment. Uh, while poverty and isolation uh, and high levels of illiteracy contribute to their destitution, discrimination against uh, Roma at uh, various levels, including among uh, in relations with police, prosecutors, and officials, also play an important part of perpetuating their secondary status. Um, I would just add to this that um, Roma, uh, as I mentioned, are not a monolith, as well as the Ukrainian society. And here I'm trying to draw the parallels between uh, the Roma community and the broader social uh, context in which we live in Ukraine, uh, which recognizes the diversity of its own uh, people. Um, speaking about the institutional framework and the national Roma strategy, which is uh, an important uh, base for um, civil society organizations, Roma civil society organizations, and also uh, is a reflection of uh, as, uh, assumed commitments by the uh, by the Ukrainian government. Uh, so, as I also said, the fact that Ukraine has adopted the, such policies as the National Roma Strategy uh, in itself does not constitute an improvement, uh, but also uh, it's enabled, um, mm, it provided some space, such as a number of consultative mechanisms for cooperation with state authorities. Uh, however, uh, the lack of budgetary provisions in the uh, in this policy of Roma integration uh, pose a significant problem for the realization of the goals enshrined in these documents. Uh, this comes, uh, brings us to the conclusion that uh, without allocating budgetary provisions, this uh, does not uh, constitute uh, a firm political will to improve indeed the situation. And here it very much relies on the civil society organizations, which have uh, support from the international community, from international organizations, and uh, as well as the state is very much relying on the international community in dealing with uh, 
improving the situation of Roma. Um, so I think one of the key positive developments here that I would mark is that the Roma integration policy has significantly contributed to the acceptance of Roma NGOs as an equal member of the Ukrainian civil society movement. And I think this is very important because uh, through all these years adopted in 2013 and uh, expiring in 2020, th throughout this period of time, uh, Roma NGOs managed to establish cooperation with state authorities uh, and other civil society organizations. And uh, if you look uh, on our webpage of the Chirikli Fund uh, later uh, in the end of the presentation, I will show it. Um, you can explore some of the work we do in more detail. Um, so, and coming to the last point of my presentation, speaking about uh, the, a bit in more details with, about the Roma movement, I'll try to be short here. Um, it is, I think, worth noting that uh, the Roma movement as such has transformed from uh, ethnic and cultural organizations following the post-Soviet model of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, self-determination and uh, uh, fight for equality. So they followed the classic post-Soviet model uh, gathering in cultural, ethnic organizations, and then trans on being under the influence of um, the, the Roma movement in Europe, uh, it transformed into human rights uh, movement somehow, not entirely, but a large part of it, including our organization, which started as a small uh, NGO, which worked in a small city and was mainly dealing with uh, culture and social adaptation. Um, so after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the organization, the Roma organization started to emerge and until now, until today, uh, they operate. And as I said, they became really an active player uh, in the landscape of civil society organization. Um, uh, here, I would like to add that the ability of Ukrainian government to achieve ambitious, this ambitions that, that are declared in future will therefore provide an important determinant on the broader transition of the country uh, to human rights, democracy, and social progress. And uh, Last but not least, I would like to focus on the situation with regard to hate-motivated crimes um, and uh, radical far-right groups. Um, the relationship between uh, state, um, state bodies and uh, far-right organizations remain, unfortunately, rather firm in Ukraine. In my view, this poses certain uh, challenges, uh, speaking about those internal challenges, to developing th that multiculturalism and inclusive policies that we spoke about in the beginning. And uh, until these ties between these groups and the state are served, the climate for Roma LGBT and other marginalized communities will only worsen. Violent uh, anti-Gypsyism as a special form of racism against trauma uh, is enabled first and foremost by the absence of public sanctions against its perpetrators. Uh, such a state of affairs, I would call uh, a vicious circle of weak justice system response that uh, in itself generates impunity, normalization, and acceptance of hate-motivated violence. And summing up, uh, having said all uh, these key uh, points in my view, 
um, I still am of the opinion that Ukraine is on the path of um, intense transformations. And uh, throughout the last six years, it has undergone through a significant path of uh, that changed it, the country, that changed uh, what we see as modern Ukraine. And um, I have to say, I'm happy to be part of these changes and happy to be part of the civil society movement. And uh, I think uh, having such discussions is also contributing a lot to shaping what we want to see uh, as a Ukraine as a political nation is not only uh, you know it's something very limited. Let's broaden the vision. Thank you, and looking forward to our further discussion. Thank you, Yolian, for that really interesting presentation. Our next speaker today is Emine Ziyadinova. She is a Crimean Tatar documentary photographer and independent consultant based in London. She currently works in the nonprofit and media development sphere. Her experience places her at the intersection of documentary photography, human rights, advocacy, and journalism. Um, her work has been supported by a Fulbright Scholarship and a Magnum Foundation Emergency Fund Fellowship, and her photography projects have been exhibited in Ukraine as well as internationally. And so I turn over the mic to Emine. Thank you, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, I will be talking about Crimean Tatars in Ukraine today and um, otherness. Uh, but I um, wanted to share with you some thoughts I had before. Uh, so as I was asked to talk today about Crimean Tatars and otherness and race in Ukraine, I was like thinking what I will, actually, I was thinking what not to say today, Razor, what to say. So I kind of caught myself on this thought and I was like, I should really like adjust it. And I want to explain why. The question of race and ethnicity in Ukraine today is quite a politicized question. As I didn't really want to say and focus on my negative experiences as Crimean Tatar in Ukraine, uh, because um, then like I kind of would be supporting Russian propaganda discourse about Nazi and far right Ukraine. But in the same time, I didn't want to say something about Russia as you all know, Russia, Crimea is annexed by Russia in 2014 because my family still live there. So I didn't want to put some kind of like unwanted pressure on them um, as since annexation of Crimea in 2014, the, uh, the criticism of Russia in Crimea could be percepted as extremism, terrorism or separatism uh, by Russian law. So, and also because Julian, like a little bit touched on it. I think Ukrainian, Ukrainian national idea is not very, like, is not established enough. And it's kind of developing now since 2014 a lot. So to challenge certain elements of this idea of Ukrainian, as I think, by talking about race and nationalism in Ukraine, sometimes, like, I would say challenging. Um, so, that's uh, that's what I'm coming from, and um, and um, I wanted um, to share some of my personal experiences today, actually, with you, uh, and uh, experiences of my family, how myself and my family encountered otherness um, as Crimean Tatars since we returned to Ukraine to it was still Soviet Union in 1990. Uh, from Uzbekistan. Uh, my family uh, was deported uh, in 1944 by Stalin regime. Uh, and um, along with 240,000 Crimean Tatars to Ural and Central Asia. And uh, just to note that up to 35% of Crimean Tatars actually uh, within two years died as a result of these tragic events. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, so as we came back, 
I think in the uh, 90s. I think um, uh, one of the first narrative probably we encountered as a otherness when we came back, it was what I identified and call Soviet narrative. Uh, and um, uh, it is um, this Soviet narrative, which I call Soviet, uh, includes the notion of otherness through such labels as uh, traitors, not worth to trust, enemies of the state, barbarians, villains, and people who belong to Asia. And uh, this narrative um, have roots in, uh, in how Soviet Union and Stalin regime justified deportation of Crimean Tatars in 1944 by saying that Crimean Tatars collaborated with Nazis against the Soviet Union. And Soviet propaganda pretty much supported that idea, including that Crimean Tatars appeared in Crimea with Mongol Tatars, with invaders, and um, uh, and so and so on. But this narrative, I would say, is one of the most persistent and the most dominant in today's Ukraine as well. So, uh, like certain elements of it. So. <laughs> I probably would, I, I would like to share, I'll, I would like to give some examples of it. So one of the most recent experience I had, which I encountered that narrative was probably in 2000, it was 2014 in Kiev, um, the taxi driver who drove me several times to airport as I was working as a journalist and reporting in Eastern Ukraine and in Crimea. And we were, it was a sort, trip he was driving me to airport and we were talking and he was asking me how my work uh, in Crimea, how was annexation, how was situation there and we talked about Maidan and I was like I was talking yeah but situation with Crimean Tatars is quite bad so everyone is really worried and he told me back I was like you know I mean you know in Soviet Union there were like two type of groups it's Crimean Tatars and Chechens who were not worth of trust and it was right to deport them, uh, which of course led to the conflict from my side because he clearly didn't put me in the group of Crimean Tatars when he said it. And I said, do you, do you want to say that my family was deported and killed for because we are Crimean Tatars and it was right that the Soviet Union did it? It led to quite a discussion and conflict and he kind of shut up and didn't want to continue it. Um, and then another one is 2016, actually after annexation, I was working with a um, uh, Swedish journalist in Crimea University of Annexation. And, um, and we were doing a report about water crisis in Crimea and uh, agriculture. And they were like, we, want, we were in one of the villages and we were interviewing one of the like local women in the village. And she was talking about like water crisis and about uh, growing greens, uh, and then like there were like a couple boys ran around and they were like, "Oh, look, these Tatars! You know, you never know when they stab you in the back." And of course, she also said it. I mean, not like literally, probably, and also, but because she probably also didn't put me in the like this. Even though I look Crimean Tatar, <laughs> she didn't put me in that group because I was with Western journalists speaking English, looking different uh, as a foreigner, probably. So, and, um, and I would say with annexation of Crimea in 2014, this discourse also quite became quite prominently alive again with the crisis and um, especially in Crimea. And, um, and so because Crimean Tatars supported as a group Ukraine and didn't support Russian annexation and didn't participate in so-called referendum, and, uh, and so these kind of things like come up so much. And my mom says that as a one moment through her life when she felt the most other and the most threatened. Um, and uh, uh, my aunt who lives on the same street uh, where I grew up, she told that her neighbor who we have been living in the same street for more than 25 years now, came to her during March, 2014 and said, oh, could I take your house if you will get deported again? And, and this is a neighbor which like very good relationship with and friends and, and it just like this otherness just 
comes up, bursts out as a crisis appears or like the moment there is like problem. Um, but I would, I would say that majority of Ukrainians I still, we are not talking about Crimea, like a big Ukraine still didn't encounter probably in their real life a single Crimean Tatar. Um, uh, because like 95% of Ukraine, Ukraine is very homogeneous. It's 95% of Ukraine consists of Ukrainians and Russians, 75% of Ukrainians and 17% of Russians, I would say. And, um, and so when you are there, it's like, it's very noticeable. <laughs> Um, and, um, and, and so Crimean Tatars is, it's, if you count occupied territories in Ukraine, it's 0.5% of population of Ukraine. Um, so even though there is IDPs in Kiev and Lviv now, there is still like probably majority of Ukrainians still didn't encounter and still live within like this kind of like this traitory, not worth of trust and mixed with, I would say, Ukrainian historical narrative is quite alive. And the second narrative I wanted to talk about is Ukrainian historical narrative, which pretty much goes with like how modern Ukrainian history narration or discourse is built around um, ethnic history, Ukrainian ethnic history. And um, and I studied in history department in Lviv University. Um, and so, so of course, Crimea state or Crimean Tatar history is not integrated in the general Ukrainian history. It's, it's rather outsider, outside, outsider external history, which comes up within Ukrainian history, within like fighting between Kazakhs and Crimean Tatars. And, um, this Ukrainian historical narrative otherness, I would label like it's uh, include these labels like um, or constitute itself through the discourses of um, invaders, enemies, allies discourse, like through the Kazakh state, uh, Crimean Tatars equal to Turkish interests or Ottoman Empire, then. Um, common abuser and enemy, which is through the history, it's Russian Empire, Catherine II, who dispersed Kazakhs and dispersed Crimean Tatar state. Then the Soviet Union, who pretty much uh, was, had very negative effects on Crimean, Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. And then a new twist to it is Russian Federation with an annexation of Crimea and war in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, that is another discourse and I think I mean, this discourse, Ukrainian historical discourse, I think like it consists both like of, of negative and positive elements and um, for, an, and how it constitutes like, I wanna give like negative and positive examples. So one of the negative examples, like how it constitutes itself is um, for example, there were like as a protest of Crimean Tatars when they return, like, so when we returned in the 90s, there were no land, there were nothing, never nowhere to return. So there were, protests and Crimean Tatars like kind of occupied some lands um, around neighborhoods in, like in the outskirts of big cities um, because uh, with, with, um, because because there were no any help from the state and people were returning to nowhere pretty much even though during deportations there were like houses taking on the property and so a Ukrainian state like <clears throat> Well, maybe that's not correct. I don't know. I, but I think there was some kind of link when Ukrainian state pretty much like within policies would not support, first of all, the settlements and second of all, would not legalize the settlements for years and years and years. And I think partly because of this narrative of not trust in it, but also like a, a fear of the separatism could come up from Crimean Tatar side in Crimea and maybe with a link to Turkey uh, and like it's kind of like a fifth column, like perceived as a fifth column some, in some way in, you, within Ukraine before 2014. I think that narrative actually is dead now, uh, but, um, and this like kind of all the narrative shifted to the positive one when we like kind of Crimean Tatars like have a common enemy now 
and have common goals like to return Crimea to Ukraine and stuff like that. Um, but um, this historical narrative, like sometimes it kind of comes out very in very funny way in your daily life. Um, I remember I was dating um, a Ukrainian guy when I was in university and um, I dated him for a long time and I knew his family, I knew his brother and everyone. And then like when, as we were had like conflict and we were about to split up, of course my ethnic belonging came up from his brother. And it was like, oh, why do you need this Crimean Tatar? Like she's Tatar, she's not worth to trust you. And it's like, and so it comes up in like in daily life, I would say. Um, and like, and generally, like, I mean, I can give examples, like somehow like it comes up in the conversation, oh, we are friends, like Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians, we fought against Russian empire, or now we're fighting against Russia. Um, uh, especially like um, when people need to justify like, oh, I'm going to go there to justify like conversation, especially when they meet you and they ask you a Crimean Tatar and then they try to make a connection. Um, uh, that is that and um, um, Julian touched a little bit on Ukrainian political narrative, like recent one, which like kind of made it try to incorporate different approaches and diversity diversity into political narrative like and have a common like a, a bigger goal of reuniting Ukraine. Um, and I think like it's worth to mention this positive change like very much like I think um, actually having uh, having a Crimean, like prominent, like noticeable Crimean Tatars in cultural life now in Ukraine as singer Jamala or like as um, cinema, as a cinema director, Akhtem Seydablayev um, and some young ones and some prominent young people, Crimean Tatars in politics as Emine Djepar actually play out a big role in this like positive change of a new, new narrative uh like which try to embrace diversity um i mean there is a couple marginal uh narratives as well um actually one is not marginal it's um one i forgot to talk it's a religious narrative it's um of course crimean, crimean tatars are muslim so and some of them are more um uh, secular and some of them more orthodox muslim like so but still there is this otherness constitutes through religion a lot too. And, what, and there is also marginal discourse which, or narrative, which is ethnic superiority and race um, narrative, which is like quite, um, um, quite present through far right groups and uh, neo-Nazis and skinheads. And I just wanna say these groups exist everywhere in Crimea, in Donbass, in Lviv, in, in, in Kiev, I mean, they're small, but they, they are there and it's not, it's not Ukrainian, I mean, it's just far right groups. Um, and, um, and I did, I personally encountered in Lviv first time when I was a student, 2008, 2010 it was, as, um, <laughs> as, as I tried to get a cigarette from someone in the bar and the person said, Oh, you know, I'm I'm supporting a, a healthy Ukrainian white nation, and I was like, "What? And what? What do you mean by Ukrainian nation?" And he said, "It's someone who supports Ukraine, loves Ukraine, and speaks Ukrainian." I said, "You know, I speak Ukrainian better than you, probably." Um, but um, what I'm trying to say, it exists. And what is like really worries me is that this part of this ethnic superiority and race narrative is a little bit it overlaps with Ukrainian nationalism, patriotism discourse as well, which is based like quite a lot on the idea of Ukrainian ethnicity um, and love of you for Ukraine, like, or like if you're a patriot and you support the Ukrainians as a main group, then you can be included. Um, uh, so um, that is, um, something which worried me a little bit, but I also want to say that generally, as Crimean Tatar, I had um, 
a positive experiences it's like a lot of positive experience and have a lot of friends and uh i I want to tell that uh, if you ask me if I was discriminated based on ethnicity, I would say no. And uh, Ukraine did give me opportunities. Um, and um, I love Ukraine. I love Kiev. <laughs> um, I would like to go back. I don't live there now. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, there is a lot of to, there is a lot of work to do on on diversity and tolerance in Ukraine. I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Emine. Um, so our final uh, main panelist today is Theodorina Kamus Vavruk. She is a teacher, a translator, a volunteer with the African Council of Ukraine. Um, and she was born in she was born in France, and her mother's Ukrainian, and her father is from Chad. Um, she was faced with problems in connection with her race, and she has worked as a volunteer in Ukraine trying to draw people draw people's attention to the issues of racial discrimination in Ukraine. And for the past 10 years, she's been a member of the African Council of Ukraine, a non-governmental organization for which she serves as the moderator of class lessons and tolerance at Ukrainian schools. So I'll turn it over to her now. Yeah, Darina, can you make your visual larger, larger? Oh, now? A little bit larger. Right now, like like this? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, and um, so I was born, yes, as I said, I was born in France and, uh, but grew up here in Ukraine. So, and, um, my whole life, I, I could say, so I saw different um, problem, not only like uh, diversity and to be other, not only in Ukraine, but also in other uh, parts of the world, like in Africa, So, but it's a little bit different. Uh, so what about Ukraine? I could say that uh, uh, from one side, from one side we can uh, see, um, can you see here? No, we cannot Stati see. St uh, statistic uh, of Bogardus. Can you can you show again? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Okay. So and um, here uh, in this scale, you can see uh, how people treat to different ethnic groups. And uh, and uh, uh, as you can see here, Africans is. Um, before Roma people. And it's really true um, because um, we are very different from Ukrainians, like Ukrainians, Ukrainians. That's why, of course, uh, for now, we, um, uh, we have this uh, such uh, attitude and uh, intolerant uh, attitude. Uh, from one side, uh, I would like to say that um, if you watch on TV, uh, the situation is quite different because, as we can see, a uh, very famous singer like Gaetana, and uh, I can share one second. Yeah. Uh, Gaetana, she went to Eurovision, she presented Eurovision in 2012. Uh, she uh, was a singer from Ukraine, and uh, but uh, it was, she, she took a fifth place. And also you can see Jean Belenyuk, he's African-Ukrainian, and he works in parliament. Uh, and uh, for those who, watch the situation from TV, they think that uh, everything is perfect in Ukraine, there is no racism, there is no intolerance attitude. But uh, for common people, the situation is quite different. Uh, every day, uh, as I work in African Council in Ukraine, uh, people 
write us and people call us and uh, they complain for the problem uh, which they meet every day because of the array. And uh, the biggest problem is for children at the school uh, because Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, because um, to adults, you can explain that, uh, okay, we're all different. And uh, moreover, now people tra start to travel all around the world and uh, they more get used for other people with different color of skin. But for children, it's, it's, still, it's still difficult to uh, to, uh, to to make to feel the same with uh, children with different uh, color skin, and um, last year it was uh, a very very sad uh, case when one girl she was bullied for many years, but uh, her parents didn't know about this. And uh, she was bullied because of her color skin. Uh, she is African Ukrainian, uh, so uh, it was on the uh, on, on the break. And uh, after bullying, she uh, she said she was so upset that she decided to suicide. Uh, thanks to God, she survived. She jumped over the window. And uh, yes, but she survived. And uh, after that, after that, um, in, on, in Parliament, uh, they decided to act and to react on this situation and to make prophylactic uh, in all schools against bullying. So uh, it's um, a little bit difficult to. Uh, work and to see such uh, unpleasant situation and such difficult situation and uh, but we try to do all the best and uh, as for me I know I passed uh, through all this and uh, uh, for me now the main question is what we can all do to improve this situation and uh, of course, in the end of this uh, conference, I would like that everybody share maybe some different methods uh, which really work and uh, how to do it faster because uh, every day uh, somebody suffer because of uh, his skin color or because of his diversity uh, in, in clothes, in religion, and uh, in race also. Apart from positive things, uh, I could say that, um, of course, uh, not only negative uh, side to be different uh, in Ukraine, uh, the other, po other positive side that uh, last time, uh, it's very popular to, uh, to be like, uh, I can say, I could say that uh, it's very popular to, and it's more easier to become famous in such area as uh, um, singers, if you are a singer, if you are a musician, and uh, if you are a sportsman. And uh, I could say that uh, Africans and African Ukrainians, Ukrainians, they are quite strong, and uh, there is no many sportsmen in that area. Uh, like uh, champion and um, also uh, now more possibilities, especially um, if you are. Um, I could say that um, for those uh, who really, who really, uh, who really struggle uh, in such uh, area like in culture of because we can see that uh, on TV um, there is now many uh, African, especially African Ukrainians, works on TV also as a journalist. 
Uh, so it's also a positive, very positive moment. Uh, but from other side, uh, many Ukrainians, they consider that like Africans, they are um, like group of uh, like lazy and primitive people. Why? Because uh, very often they say that like, look, uh, most of them, they work on the market and uh, so they are ignorant. And so many people looking at them, uh, they, they have prejudice. Uh, but indeed, uh, if uh, you'll ask such people who work on the market, most of them, they have one or two diplomas, which they received in Ukrainian university. And, but so the question why they work on the market, because it's impossible to find a, a qualified work uh, if you're a doctor, first, because you don't know language, and second, uh, because of uh, prejudice, people prejudice. So some private clinic, uh, they agree to take black doctor, I mean like African doctor, yes, or uh, Indian doctor from any country, but because of their skin color, uh, the patient will not go to them. So uh, this is also a big problem. Uh, so uh, what else? I, I want to add that uh, every year, like uh, for example, last year, uh, more than 21,000 students came from Africa to study here in Ukraine. And Ukraine really gives good education. Uh, but uh, uh, from other side, uh, we should think how to protect this student from uh, such people as skinhead and other group, uh, which against uh, uh, students and in general African people, uh, because most of them they think that uh, okay, so they come first as a student, but then they. Uh, they will live in Ukraine, they will stay in Ukraine, and uh, here in Ukraine will be Africa instead of Ukraine. Uh, so like uh, in, invasion. But indeed, it's, it is not like this. Uh, people come here, to students come here because of uh, really good education, and Ukraine can be very proud because of it. And, but yes, from other side, uh, we should do something to explain to people that uh, uh, it's just a student. And uh, it's uh, very, very uh, painful to see when uh, Ukrainian students treat sometimes bad. I don't, I don't say that, of, uh, that always, no, it is not like this because Many of African and Ukrainian students, they have really good uh, friendship. Uh, but other groups, they really hate and uh, hate African students. And uh, uh, very, uh, especially like in Kharkov um, and in Chernobyl also, there was many case of uh, attack uh, on African because of the skin color. So this, this is very bad. Uh, uh, so maybe something, some questions, I don't know. Thank you, Teodorina. Um, so finally, um, we're gonna move on to our discussant, Professor Natalia. Kanyeka Friesen, um, who will comment on the presentations by our panelists um, before we move on to the question and answer period from the audience. Um, Natalia is the director of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, and she is the professor and Hukulak chair in Ukrainian culture and ethnography at the University of Alberta. Um, her research interests include oral history, vernacular culture, narrative and ritual, diasporas, ethnicity, and migration post-socialist Ukraine and Eastern Europe and Canada and Ukrainian Canadians.
I'll mute Natalia yourself. I just did. Thank you, Kimberly, uh, for your uh, lovely introductions for today's uh, presentations. And I'm especially also thankful for all the participants around this uh, round, virtual round table. Um, I wanted to remind ourselves in the first place and also to those in the audience that we are uh, gathered in a unique kind of a dialogue today. We, in fact, all of us had an opportunity to connect uh, a day ago to just discuss how we will proceed with this event. And we've reflected on the fact that it is perhaps for the first time that voices and represent, representation of different communities from around Ukraine were brought uh, into the same space and, and are being shared right now in the form of this round table. And the second point I wanted to make is that also the, this idea with dialogue is also based on, the, on, on, on another kind of a duality. We, academic institutions such as Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies in partnership with Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and other institutions out there who uh, Kimberly kindly uh, mentioned in her introductions. We are uh, oftentimes immersed in academic discourses and critical analysis of various issues, but in today's context, we are in some ways involved in what might be called com uh, university community uh, conversations because we also have not just academics in the room, but representatives and um, members of uh, various movements, members of uh, active members of uh, uh, various uh, ethnic and cultural groups in Ukraine. So this, with this idea in mind, I also initially I felt, and I will go that route, uh, to return back to, to, to the vocabulary with which we are, um, uh, on which we're focusing today, an idea of otherness, an idea of race and racism. Um, and myself, I'm an anthropologist. I, I, I do teach uh, occasionally some lectures on racism to the students in anthropology. And I do bring up, of course, this very important idea how much of a constructed co uh, concept it is, how much it is an invention uh, when it comes down to human effort to categorize and put our diverse humanity into whatever boxes. So, uh, but nonetheless, this notion of otherness, this focus on, on distinctness of someone else and his or her being not the same as myself is something which is routinely present from one traditional culture, the other traditional culture in historical context around the world. So the various traditional societies around the globe, of course, used to be characterized by that certain degree of you know, prejudice, but also fascination and curiosity, but also mistrust of outsiders and eventually of all others not fitting into whatever social norms the society thinks it has. So somewhat anthropologically speaking, this innate recognition of someone's uniqueness is a universal factor of human cultures. This idea of otherness, many other scholars outside of anthropology has been, of course, advocating and claiming that this very idea of otherness, this, this hook up on it is, is a fundamental category of human conception of the world, of human thought. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's part of what constitutes our archetypal thinking of the world. What is left, what is right, what is top, what is bottom, what is us, what is them, what is good, what is bad. So this is the broader context. But the point, of course, of importance to us is to ask the question what one does with this recognition rather than it recognition itself. Kimberly and myself are participating in this event from our respective locations in Canada and the United States. And um, in my comments today, I want, I'll probably draw a little bit on, on our native context or our, or our cultural and national context as, as, as we are the participants here. So, uh, you know, if I start with this idea what term race is invested with, as I've pointed out, it is a construct. It is uh, understood and used differently from one context to another. It's operationalized this differently. But in, interestingly, of course, it's oftentimes projected as an innocent concept. I thought of an incident from my own life when I was a young girl, grade two or grade three, I think, and I was still a Soviet child back in those uh, times of my uh, childhood. I was taught in a geography class of human diversity around the world. And I was exposed and, and that idea was hammered in my head that human 
diversity is represented very neatly by five races, rasa. So these five races are neatly bound to certain geographic areas. And for some reason, there was five. Uh, and this, the innocence, of course, was not lost on me uh, when I grew up a little bit old and I realized all that scientific terminology, which was, again, put into the heads of seven, eight-year-old kids of my generation, in fact, has been routinely used in derogative ways in everyday context of Soviet lives. And I'm not going to be reciting those words, but perhaps those representatives of my generation coming from that experience of being a child in USSR would remember those. So this, in a sense, is, of course, an illusion. And, uh, but still, the word race, at least in the USSR, was not really operationalized in legal ways, as rasa as a word was not used in relationship to the peoples within the Soviet Union. And Ukraine is, of course, is the, the, the country, the successor of the um, USSR. But if you take a look back in the United States and Canada, here's an interesting context for us to consider. In the US, the term race actually has a legal weight and it has uh, a status and it has a value. Uh, and I'm just reminded of, for example, of how American United States are conducting their censuses. This is a great uh, segue for us to see how this society and its bureaucratic apparatus and its official institutional discourse conceives of its own peoples. Of course, the United States folks would remember very well the census conducted back in 2020, one of many, and previous ones were based on similar ideas, so even probably even deeper entrenched in notions of racism, as I will speak of later. But uh, I'm citing here a line, for example, for us to just connect, get connected. The 2020 census will ask you a series of questions about you and each person who lives in with you when responding you will record the race of each person who is living in your household as of april 1st the census uh, folks the, the ones who've designed this instrument and tool to to measure the american population of course puts a disclaimer out there stating that race categories generally reflect social definitions in the us and are not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. But a curious explorer of that tool, when scrolling down, say, in the website, you can do that later as well after this particular gathering of ours, will arrive at the list of offered categories which the Americans are invited to choose from when it comes down to self-identification along the lines of what census states racial identity. The first category which appears at the top starts with the letter W, and hard to guess which one is that, the whites. And then it goes down. The Black or African American would be the second on the list, and then American Indian or Alaska Native is the next, then Asian, then you have Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and then there's a line of some other race. The tool itself, of course, allows for further uh, detailed uh, listing of self-identities there, but in it was not lost on me uh, that while disclaimers points out that we are here not to construct or produce a sense of race in any anthropological, genetical, or biological tools, for sure, socially constructed notion of race in the United States is operated also in the way as it's been represented through the list of those categories listed. If you move to Canada, go up north uh, and uh, see how Canadians document uh, the variety of its own of their own population, rather the Canadian state, I would say. Canadian census does not operate with the notion of race, and it works with a different notion. It works with the idea of ethnicity, ethnic origins, and also ancestry. For sure, we understand racism, at least when it comes down to the Americas, as having deep roots in cultures of colonialism and in the European expansion and imperial drive, in, that, in this case, when it comes to North America, of the Europeans to, to conquer and the rest of the, the, the New World and to establish new order there. It's been done differently in the United States, slavery and, and the fact that the US colonies for a long period of time relied on 
the, you know, trade in humans on shipment of millions of Africans from Africa is not going to be lost in the national discourse of the Americans and what it means to be the United uh, 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 an American. Canadian history is also entrenched in colonial expansion by two empires, British and French. But at the same time, the methods which the uh, British and French in what today is Canada uh, were different. The treaties with indigenous peoples were signed and that in a way con constituted the basis for the Canadian nation to evolve. But importantly, those treaties were ignored and, uh, and, and mistreated as such, resulting in bringing up to perhaps less uh, verbalized but no less painful experiences of racism as native, sorry, the indigenous uh, populations of Canada, indigenous nations of Canada have been experiencing. So all these three contexts, the former Soviet uh, context, the American, the Canadian context, yet again confirms or, or illustrates this idea of how uh, a notion of race can be operationalized differently, how it can be construed differently. And um, the, uh, the, 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 this brings us back to this important point that if there's any way or form the word as many tried to pitch it as innocently as political powers or established groups in, in control of other groups would try to advocate for its innocence or for its neutrality, think of American census, for example. It's an inherently loaded term. Uh, race can be a very dangerous construct. So while the word itself has been used to first explain diversity maybe or then categorize the human variation, and, and as I said, to put us all in different, differently labeled boxes. It also eventually was used to rationalize and exploit that diversity in very, and oftentimes very dark ways. And such rationalization and subjugation of one group by another is what constitutes the core of the meaning of racism. And so it's a systemic practice. It is a systemic practice. It's about discrimination based on perceived Ethnic or cultural otherness is about rationalization of difference, justification of prejudice, and its subsequent legitimization and institutionalization. Americas had their own history. European continent had its own history of racism. And just for the sake of time, of course, I, we, we, we don't have enough time to elaborate on all the details, but immediate examples which come to mind would be from mid 20th century, the, the persecution, the extermination of entire people such as Roma and Jewish uh, people by the Nazi regime is most illustrative case here. And then there would be socialism uh, arriving onto the continent and, and bringing in new policies or new perspectives, new ways of crafting this idea of otherness, new ways of dealing with diversity. For some period of, and still many commentators and analysts uh, when looking back at socialist regimes and countries have asserted that socialist countries in fact have offered significantly greater political economic equality for their ethnic and racial minorities rather than say capitalist countries did. But we've heard today from our presenters uh, that this definitely has not been the case in Ukraine and definitely has not been the case in rest of socialist countries as well. So in reality, when it come or came to such important markers as um, of markers of equality and equity as access to income, access to healthcare, access to education, and access to power, so socialism failed, dramatically failed its minorities. And some cases, as it's been the case with Crimean Tatars in, in, in the Soviet Union, uh, it actively repressed and persecuted and um, uh, its, its own cultural groups on a racial basis. Today, we had an opportunity to hear the, the complexities of Ukrainian case. Uh, we are uh, very blessed to be able to participate in this conversation with such bright, bright young intellectual, bright young intellectuals. And I'd like to remind everybody in the room, everybody speaks wonderful English and many people in this room speak many other languages. So this is just to, to those of us who speak only English and maybe Ukrainian. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a group of bright minds who have uh, acutely pointed out to us all the challenges that Ukrainian society, Ukrainian state is facing today when it comes down importantly to um, 
to these very important points you brought up, uh, my, my colleagues around the table. So Ukraine's post-socialist search for the answers to the questions, what is Ukrainian nation? What it means to be Ukrainian? I will also add, of course, we it's been recognized today that uh, also this ever-evolving political situation which emerged in Ukraine in post-Maidan times uh, had further complicated that, that the dialogue which is being now established and being promoted and advocated for in Ukraine for inter-ethnic, healthy inter-ethnic relations. We've also briefly pointed out to the rise of uh, far-right movements in Ukraine. Let's not be um, uh, just focusing on Ukraine here. It is a trend which is sweeping around the globe. And the fact that we're facing such powerful social movements in support of Black Lives Matters and other movements uh, uh, around the world right now taking place on the globe. U Ukraine has been subject to these very global processes of radicalization uh, of uh, what we've seen happening elsewhere. As uh, all of you, Emine, Julian, and Tedorina had mentioned, there's lots to do. And uh, we're very thankful for your bringing up all these points and pointing out at least some directions in which Things are only happening on the ground and also indicating this far more needs to be done. So thank you for starting this conversation. And I do have a few questions for, for all of you. Some may be our shared questions and some are a little bit more specific. Um, and I'll just spell them out for the sake of time. And then in the same order, maybe you can address them if you if you feel like elaborating on them. So Julian, we, we have talked, or not you, but many have been um, uh, colleagues of yours and you specifically, and also as well as scholars and academics have been looking at the situation of Roma and some have pointed out that it perhaps can be seen as a bit unique when compared to other ethnic groups. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more from your perspective, what we should understand under this uniqueness. Um, and the second question to you, Julian, uh, you did bring up the, and that's probably a question to everybody at this point, the Im important movements and self-mobilization which takes place within the Roma uh, community in Ukraine, I hope is not taken in isolation. And you've pointed out to partners outside of Ukraine. So how strong is this um, collaborative momentum? What are the points of the, being involved with say European organization, but also what are the benefits and what are the potential outcomes of that? I think that might be a good question for the rest of you folks as well. But more specifically, Emine, if I can move on to you, I, um, I very much appreciated your take on, on and you're, you're, you are an historian. You have brought in a historical perspective on the, into the discussion of the evolution of the sense of otherness which Crimean Tatars have been experiencing in Ukraine. Um, and if I go back to the period of 2014, the uh, period, uh, the uh, year when everything has started unfolding in the wrong direction in Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, the beginning of Eastern, uh, 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 sorry, the military conflict in Eastern Ukraine. And uh, in this particular context, I, I am spending a lot of time in Ukraine and I have many intelligentsia friends who have anyway discovered Crimean Tatars for themselves. And many have been, you know, advocating for this allyedness, allyship rather, the, the, the sorry, Crimean Tatars they have claimed have become, they are us, they are part of who we are. I hear this discourse in certain circles and I'm probably part of that circle. But I'm curious whether what would be a, a, a Crimean Tatar perspective on this renewed uh, love affair between Ukrainians and Crimeans. And you did bring up a few points, but I think um, it, I wonder if there is a bit of an institutional or a bit of a broader um, collective perspective, uh, maybe which represented by uh, Crimean Tatars. And to Odarina, if I may, um, thank you so much. I know you wanted to show a few wonderful images to, which were to illustrate all the points you were making. Sorry for the technical glitches, it didn't happen again, too bad, but nonetheless, you were uh, 
to hear what you had to say it was very important for us to now reflect back on all the affairs we're facing and dealing with. I wanted to ask you maybe to give our viewers a little bit more of a background information on how organized African Ukrainians might have been or are, and uh, uh, also how well uh, the established African Ukrainians are working maybe with foreign students who you've already mentioned are you know also are part of a bigger um, diversity palette of Ukraine. And if I will be allowed one more uh, question addressed to all, this would be this. So we are hosting this event in response to and in support of uh, global movement to fight racism and racial discrimination, but also as a way of introducing English speaking audiences to the complexities of inter-ethnic relations in today's Ukraine. We're, we have met with wonderful uh, preparation session and now we are in this wonderful conversation, but my question is, what should be next? Thank you. So um, I believe the speakers will answer in the order of the questions. So Julian, you'll be first. Thank you, Natalia, for great questions, uh, enabling to elaborate in more details uh, on uh, specific issues uh, we were addressing. So coming to your first question regarding the uniqueness, if we can say so, of Roma, what makes Roma unique or making them stand out uh, compared to other minority groups in Ukraine? And not only in Ukraine, but in Europe in general. And uh, I can explain it by the fact that Roma are an economically marginalized community, uh, which uh, is a result of transgenerational poverty uh, among different generations. Uh, and actually, something we already highlighted uh, it was the extermination of people during the uh, socialist uh, uh, social nationalism uh, or Nazi regime, um, which Roma were also, they were basically the victims of, of those crimes. Uh, also, I think it is important to mention that those uh, actions were legal in that uh, time of Germany. And uh, this also has to do uh, with, uh, with the legal systems and how the law actually uh, protects or in another way can subject people to violence. US also has a very troubled and rich history in terms of uh, race and racism. Uh, so um, there is a lot to learn from, from the past. And I think uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have here in the room uh, many historians, people who study uh, the, the roots actually of these uh, problems that we're discussing. This is very, uh, this tells basically the essence of, of these conversations uh, that uh, we should look in, into the past and really see how to overcome certain uh, bad practices. Uh, so yes, Roma are unique uh, by the fact that they have, uh, they are economically mar marginalized and this is not something uh, good. Uh, on the other hand, this uh, makes them extremely vulnerable and uh, other aspect is uh, um, the fact that people are very illiterate. Uh, most of the intelligentsia of the Roma people was exterminated during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also prevented them from, uh, or us, <laughs> from um, uh, actually reaching the, another level of advocacy, actually, even about the Roma genocide. Canada just recently uh, recognized uh, the, the Roma genocide just like I think a month ago, uh, which is also very interesting. And Ukraine recognized it in 2000. So uh, I think this can be taken as positive developments, but it also shows that it's very troubled, uh, you know, in the perception of international community, the perception of Roma themselves, because Roma oftentimes don't, because 
of low level of education don't know their own history. Therefore, uh, like things like criminality are equated with the Romani culture. And here I have to say that this economic marginalization uh, brought us to the crisis of Roma identity and the identity of uh, us as members of societies where we live in. Because some Roma uh, in Ukraine, they will uh, very, you know, uh, not frequent mention that they are Roma. They would rather say, I'm a Moldovan or some other minority that is not so much discriminated. Um, so this is about uniqueness. And I will briefly answer about the question on cooperation and inspiration uh, by uh, the European uh, movements. Um, not only Romani movement, I would say, but also the, the black movement. Um, I had the privilege also to uh, talk to some prominent activists uh, and it, there is a lot of inspiration. And actually, um, I, I don't know, it's like about, it's about, uh, you know, it's all about supporting each other. It's all about solidarity. It's all about um, equality in the end because human rights are about equality, but nothing else like uh, making someone more equal than someone else. It, actually, it's against that. And uh, the Western Romani movement started in the 60s of the 20th century. Um, and some, maybe I will give you an example of one role model for myself. It's uh, Mr. Uh, Romani Rose. He, is, uh, he lives in, in Germany, in Heidelberg. He is the director of the uh, Roma, Romani Holocaust uh, Institute. Uh, it's like a memorial, it's a, a library, it's a research institution. And uh, that guy was uh, very radical in a way. Uh, he he was fighting against the police who was pressurely profiling the Roma. He was uh, uh, in, an intellectual and uh, also was uh, uh, explaining the reasons why Roma demand equal treatment because the after the Second World War, as when as we know, the the, the um, political system has changed in many countries and uh, the. Uh, Participation of people started uh, to be a global tendency. So, driven by all those processes, the Romani movement was not uh, standing aside and uh, very much started to, to move on. And in the 19, 1971, uh, in the outskirts of London, it was the first uh, international uh, Romani uh, Congress when uh, the Romani flag, the Romani anthem, and uh, the Romani language, Romanes, uh, was acknowledged, uh, were acknowledged as the attributes of the Romani international people. <laughs> so uh, driven by that, uh, as I said, in the 90s, uh, the Romani, uh, Roma representatives in Ukraine uh, started to uh think how to how to defend our rights because on the paper we were all equal and we are actually <laughs> on the paper we have the same rights and we don't claim any extra rights we really it's more about uh, uh equality of opportunities uh and um having said that uh, uh, uh i think um without the support actually of the Western uh, partners of the Western uh, human rights organizations, uh, I don't think Roma in Ukraine would succeed so much as we did. And uh, until nowadays, uh, the Ukrainian state does, uh, has not been providing like financial support to the Roma organizations, but rather, uh, well, in many other forms and I, uh, I'm sure like even having decent conversations, being recognized as an equal partner, this is all this also means a lot. 
Um, but as one of the in one of the questions we received from our audience, it's more like a, a facade at, at the moment. And I wish it will change uh, uh, soon. And I'm glad we can openly say things as they are. Uh, thank you, Natalia, for your questions. Um, and I, I, I move, uh, I, I give the floor uh, to other speakers. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Natalia, for a question. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I think since 2014, there is definitely a positive change. And there is, as you called, some kind of a love affair in narrative, at least, like between Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars. And um, as uh, Tiadrina sh shared with us uh, a social distancing scale, which uh, um, uh, Institute of Sociology does every year, we can see that actually, even though the Crimean Tatars like in the middle, actually the, um, uh, the attitude changed a little bit to positive within the last four or five years. Um, so uh, it's a little bit, but you, but it's noticeable, right? And I think as I was preparing as well, I asked some of my friends who are Ukrainians in Kiev, I asked them, so what do you think changed? And they did say that there is more information around about Crimean Tatars and Crimean Tatar culture. And as I mentioned, I think like actually the presence of um, some prominent cultural um, people like Jamala and cinema and photographers and journalists who moved actually IDPs, it's quite play a huge role in it. And I think part of it about IDP is that actually the people, Crimean Tatars, who moved to Kiev and Lvov mostly, are actually the most socially active, educated, and have been in international organizations in, in Crimea before they were having like a manager, like all TV channels, like media outlets, moved with all the journal, like with the main journalists, right? So it's like kind of the most socially active. Um, people moved like IDPs. So it's much easier to accept them than type of IDPs moved from Donbass who are much more less, I mean, it's both worse, <laughs> like it's forced movement, but for some it was from actually um, a shells and, uh, and war and like mines. And for some, it's from political persecution, which is a little bit different move and different type of people move like as IDPs. And I think that also played a role in it. Um, but um, I don't think this narrative itself is quite, I don't think the narrative of like love, it's like, I think it's like still lies within like, with a narrative of allies and enemies and suddenly we have a common ally. And I, I, I studied in Lviv 2004-2010 uh, before annexation and so this narrative I, I heard it before from people like saying like um, mm. against of Moscovites like oh we have a uh, mm -hmm. common goals and stuff like that so I think it's just like it's got a little bit more spread and I think like as higher education also of people they're more acceptive and I think they're much more acceptive of the idea of Crimean Tatars being part of Ukrainian nation. And I think they are much more open for idea of political nation as well than um, building it around ethnicity. Um, but what I want to touch another point about from Crimean Tatar perspective, if we think about Crimean Tatars, majority of Crimean Tatars still live in Crimea, in the next Crimea. This narrative of love, I don't think it, reaches Crimean Tatars in Crimea as much as ones who live in Kiev and Lviv or like in Ukraine now. And I think also, I think it's not so, um, how do you say, it's not easy to accept it either in the way that there is, um, people feel left alone in Crimea with their problems and clearly no one can help them with their problems and persecutions and stuff like that. And so this narrative of love affair, it sounds kind of, yeah. it's conflict with reality, I would say, and for majority of Crimean Tatars. And, um, and another thing is, um, 
for people who stayed, I think there is also like a little bit actually like the division between IDP Crimean Tatars who kind of integrated in Ukrainian society and people who stayed in an annex Crimea mm -hmm. is getting wider a little bit. And, um, and the narrative is not acceptable for people who live here and need to cope with new reality. Um, um, yeah. Um, is that what I wanted to say? Um, and about mobilization. <laughs> I think for Crimean Tatars, 2014 became such a, uh, it's, it's, it became such a big hit for self-mobilization and political organization of Crimean Tatars because pretty much majority of Crimean Tatars stay in Crimea and the organizational part and people who are most socially active moved and Middle East, which is like self self-organizing organ of Crimean Tatars, also like political representative of Crimea also moved and it's actually Russian state declared terrorist organization. And, or maybe legal, I'm not sure what's exact extremist organization, not terrorist, sorry. Um, so they work, they are in Kiev, the people who they're supposed to work with in Crimea and there is not much they can do or represent them because Ukrainian state unable to solve the problems of people who are in Crimea. Um, so um, even though Crimea, as I said, like Crimean Tatars who moved IDP, they are very active and there are a lot of NGOs and there is like really a lot of work done. And uh, I'm really like amused by people who, who run this organization as Crimean house and as Crimea source and uh, and who got involved in politics as well since um, and have been running Crimean Tatar forums and have been trying to really do really hard work in very difficult complex situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would Theodorina like to Unmute yourself. Uh, so, uh, okay, okay. So, your uh, my uh, question to me was to tell more about African Ukrainian community, correct? If it's organized, if it has a yeah, 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 sure. So, um, as I said about self uh, identity, yes, um, for African Ukrainians, it's really very, very difficult because, for example, uh, Every time when somebody meet me, uh, he asks okay, after. Uh, firstly, he thinks that I am African for 100 person. Then after five or 10 minutes, it depends. They ask, okay, we see that you're Ukrainians, but what is your self identification? So, mm -hmm. and uh, I could say that, um, yes, I have African appearance, but I grew up here and, uh, I could say that I am, uh, I am Ukrainian in spite of my appearance. <laughs> yes, but from other side, of course, uh, I love Africa and I support African culture everywhere. And um, from other side, I am African too. And uh, uh, what is the big problem uh, that some Ukrainians, they don't want uh, understand and they don't want to see us African Ukrainians is the Ukrainian. Very often they say, look at the mirror and you will understand who you are. You can say that you're Ukrainians, you can, you can sing Ukrainian songs and wear Ukrainian clothes, like uh, as you know, uh, group Chernobrivsky, for example, I can show you pictures and many others. Yes, uh, they are they're really Ukrainians and many of African Ukrainians, they have never been even in Africa. They don't know nothing about Africa. Uh, like, yeah, you see Chernobrivsky and the name of this group Chernobrivsky. So uh, this girl, she grew up here and uh, mm -hmm. uh, she's, she, she, she is African Ukrainian, but I can say she's Ukrainian more like for, yeah. And, uh, 
uh, uh, that's why we are not, and from other side, um, we are not African. We are not Ukrainians and we are not African. And firstly, uh, we were united here in, in Kiev, uh, those African Ukrainians. <laughs> we, we were united in one group. <laughs> like, we are, okay, we are not Ukrainians, we are not African. So we will create something for us where we can understand each other and share our problem. Uh, but um, a little bit later, Ukrainians and Africans joined us because, of course, we have Ukraine, most of us, we have Ukrainian mother, yes, and they also join to our community and Ukraine, uh, African father. And in such way, our uh, community now is, is really big and from different countries. And um, now uh, we work to, on, on that problem to, to give people understanding that, uh, yes, we are mixed and it could be also like this in Ukraine. It, it, is, it exists in other countries and it can be in Ukraine. And it's not bad because we combine two cultures and uh, indeed we can bring something new and it's not bad. So, um, for example, for our, <laughs> for our feast, uh, we have, uh, like we organize like uh, some Christmas party, for example, but with, uh, we are Africans wearing uh, <laughs> traditional uh, Christmas clothes, like the frost, yes, and, and um, yeah, it, it, it's really funny. And uh, from other side, we also bring African drums, we teach uh, children that they, they are from Africa also, yes. Uh, but the main, pro, um, the main, uh, the, our main goal, of course, it's uh, it's uh, the lessons of tolerance, which we provide in different schools, uh, as I said, because it's, it's really very important and uh, it's very necessary now. Like every day, almost every day, we receive letters from different parts of Ukraine that their children miss this, still miss this problem. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I have to say, probably don't have time, but I have so much more to add or to ask you. Uh, but I'll briefly mention uh, that when you were discussing your experience of what it might be called hyphenated identity, I'm reminded of, of what many Ukrainians who have immigrated to North America have experienced uh, throughout the last century or so, at least when it comes to Canada. So there's something, and there's a room for the dialogue there, how how, how is that to be a hyphenated, uh, to have a hyphenated identity? Um, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, goes back to you. Um, so we have some really great questions from the audience. I want to make sure we get to those. Um, but I did want to add just thinking about all of the experiences we've heard about today. I've, I think some of the more striking things are the Soviet legacies in terms of the idea of an enemy people or the perceptions of African people as being lazy or being incapable of taking care of themselves and how these you know, Soviet narratives from the 30s, 40s, 60s, 70s, how those are very much impacting the people who share those identities today in Ukraine and also in Russia and in the post-Soviet space. Um, another thing that really was striking to me was how each of these ethnic minority groups are striving to show that they are in fact part of the Ukrainian nation and that they do occupy space within that. And so it's asking Ukrainians, but also those of us who study the region to broaden our understanding of what can be a person of Ukrainian nation or the Russian nation. Um, and finally, I think something that we've seen in, in each of the, the discussions, we have this question of data. How many Crimean Tatars, how many Roma in the Roma community, how many African Ukrainians or people of African descent are in the region? And I think this 
is an important question because it speaks to the greater issue of if we are going to discuss and try to remedy these institutional issues, like this goes beyond cultural, these are institutional issues, you have to prove that you're significant, right? That the amount of people you're talking about matter. And so that lack of data, if you don't institutionally or officially see race, how can those people who are being identified as a separate race seek any better treatment? Um, so I, I wanna thank all of the presenters for, for giving us you know, that, kind of, that kind of lens on the very diverse um, perspectives in Ukraine. Um, so we do have some really interesting questions from the audience and um, some of them have been sent directly to the speakers and I want to make sure we get to everyone. Um, one of the first questions is for Emine and the question is how would you comment on the issue of constitutional recognition of Crimean Tatars as the indigenous people of Crimea in Kiev? Um, and so it's been an issue for the last five or six years. So the question is, um, like, what are your views on that? Um, and so then, so what I'll do is I'll give each of you a question and as you know, one person's responding, you can be thinking of your answer. Um, another question for Yulian is, uh, so thinking about Ukraine as a monolithic culture that also has minorities, um, are, are, are displaced persons such as the Roma you know, are they being able to participate in conversations of nationality? But also, how are how are they how are the people who are connected to these displaced person um, communities? How are they being impacted by ongoing conflict? Um, I'll, also, there was a question for Julian about the situation about language learning, Roma language learning in Ukraine. Um, and finally, for Tia Darina, um, so. Why, so it's about the use of the term African or Ukrainian. Is there a way to say black Ukrainian, uh, especially if someone has no experience of Africa? Can you, can you identify that way? So I think we start with Emine. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, the question is about, about constitutional recognition of the Crimean Tatars as the indigenous people of Crimea in Kiev. Um, I'm actually um, aware that the process was going, but I'm not aware, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what the result was. Um, so I'm not sure I can comment without facts to be checked before. But if you talk in general about recognition of Crimean Tatars in by Ukrainian Ukraine, Ukrainian state, we probably should talk about interest of political interest for that. So um, as Crimean I don't, I don't think there is much of interest in terms of populism or like ratings for uh, any of kind of political party uh, to support it because like, I don't think that is, I, I, I don't think it's like, I, I don't want to say it's an unpopular idea, but I don't think it's like something people think about, majority of people think about, or it would be something important for them to make a decision who to vote for. And <clears throat> Only reason like why Ukrainian state would want to do it is probably international international community and as justification to um, to argue and justify that Crimea needs to return to Ukraine. Um, but I actually, I need to check. I mean, I don't remember what was affair with recognition and, con and constitution. I think they were recognized to some level on some kind of uh, law or like the kind of project, but maybe not constitution, but I'm not sure. So I don't want to go into the details. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll move on to Ulian. Um. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, thank you, dear audience, for the questions. Uh, there was actually also one very first question, which was a bit uh, strange. <laughs> mm, if I may, I will reply to that. I know it's like not really ethical, maybe question, but the, someone was concerned uh, of the, because of the language 
of my laptop that it's in Russian and I have to acknowledge I'm a Russian speaker. I was like my uh, mother tongue is Romani and Russian. So there are two languages, but then I studied in Ukrainian, in English. Uh, I know a bit of German, <laughs> as was mentioned, we know many languages, but I'm like, I feel myself Ukrainian and I don't think it's a big problem. It's just like, you know, people are trying to find something uh, like, as I mentioned, this, like, radical, I feel it like it's radical, na like, nationalism in a way, you know, like, if you don't speak the language, you're not part of the community. But I have to say, like, in Roma community, it's like maybe 50% of, of Roma do not know the language, but I don't say to them, you're not Roma. I feel it like it's really aggressive and pointless, because, you know, as... <laughs> Kimberly replied, it's really, it, it, it's ironic and insensitive <laughs> to put such questions. But anyways, thank you. It's uh, worth also reacting, I think, to that. Uh, so the question about the monolithic society, the composition of Ukrainian society, it's um, indeed, uh, it's like very high percentage of uh, ethnic Ukrainians and Russians, like predominantly living on this territory. And if you take the Roma population, as I said, up to 400,000, if, if you convert it in the percentage uh, based on the census of 2001, it's a very small percentage of people, like 0 0.1%, uh, <laughs> which is really small. But at the same time, Roma live in compact settlements in many places still in Ukraine. And on the local level, they matter politically maybe more, uh, meaning they can be more politically active at the local level, and not only about political, but public participation, civic engagement, it's all about that. So uh, I think despite of the composition, Roma, the, this monolithic composition of the state, Roma remain quite a salient and visible uh, group and uh, unfortunately, the most visible are those uh, in, engaged in petty crimes. And uh, this is also the issue of media, how the media covers uh, this situation and reinforces basically this negative uh, perception. I have big fights, you know, with, with local media uh, programs, uh, always um, asking them, demanding basically show, to show uh, the, the, the good side, because there is a lot of good things to show as well. And this is something we're struggling to do, but we're doing with our, uh, in our organization. And uh, I think um, this is, you know, while Ukraine is really monolithic in its composition, uh, the fact that it's 130 something plus minorities living on its territory makes it very diverse rich and uh, not only uh, you know it's like uh, separate cultures but it's all one culture in fact if you look back into Ukrainian history you will see many words uh, derived from other languages you will see that those uh, languages including Romani language have preserved some Ukrainian traditional words and this uh, brings me to the second question of language um, I can say that um, recently the Ministry of Education requested from the Council of Europe some technical support on codification of Romani language in Ukraine. So there is a willingness of the state to do something about this, to help Roma with their language. And this, I think, is a very good development. And uh, one of the first initiatives of the Roma movement were actually about the language. As I said, the following this post-Soviet model of uh, uh, how the national minorities deal uh, with their affairs in the state. So language, culture, this were one of the central issues which people were using. And um, codification of Romani language was actually one of the first things to do. Um, so I think at, at the moment that I, I'm not very satisfied with, uh, with the situation, um, you know, like on, on, on the level of proficiency of Romani language among Romani people. 
And I know that, yes, in different countries, uh, the situation is different. And there was in a question reference to Macedonia and Serbia. Uh, and I have to mention that like Macedonia is very unique. They have ethnic democracy. The, the, the seats in the parliament are reserved based on uh, the ethnic composition of the state. So it's different from Ukraine. And therefore, language-wise, it is um, relevant to allow people, uh, you know, to give them more freedoms to use their language in the public life. In, in here in Ukraine, it's we don't really um, actively use uh, the narrative that we we demand our language rights and like educating ourselves on the national language. It's rather it's rather about quality of that education. It's rather about uh, access to basic services, to, um, I don't know, equal treatment, you know, avoiding racial profiling. It's not, uh, so, I mean, these are, these are the basic things uh, here. And, uh, and coming maybe quickly back to the question, what we do next after this discussion, because I've, somehow uh, forgot to reply to that. I think we really, we are, as we discussed it, it's like a good start to start with this broad discussion and then to move on. And, you know, there's a lot of processes ongoing and I think uh, um, civil society has to be like as a, not only as a partner to the state, help them do their thing. I mean, in terms of human rights commitments, but also be a watchdog and point out to like really burning issues. Uh, something that we're doing also in this discussion somehow. Um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, that's from my side, that's it. <laughs> okay, so now questions to me. Uh, why not call uh, Black Ukrainians? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, it's very interesting because um, I, I can say that uh, no, because uh, many people in Ukraine, they think that uh, if somebody black, it means that from Africa, but indeed it is not like this. And I had experience in Lviv, uh, we were in cafe and uh, two police officers asked me to, they called me and they said, um, can you help us? I asked, well, what should I do? They said, uh, you should interpret one boy who was uh, who was attacked. I said, uh, okay, but uh, from which country he is? They said, he is from India. I said, so I can help you because uh, I don't know any language uh, from India. And he said, but what's the matter? He is black, you are black, you all understand each other. So, but... <laughs> We are even from different continents, so it's impossible to understand each other. And uh, that's why black Ukrainians, okay, but from which, uh, from where? Uh, people can be black from, from other continents even. So from Asia, from Latin America. So African Ukrainian, it, at least it points from which continent. Uh, that's why African Ukrainian. Thank you. I do want to thank everyone. We're running out of time, but I want to thank all of our amazing presenters today, our discussant, um, and the great questions from the audience. And thank you, audience, for taking time out of your day to be here in this digital world with us. Um, and so really, we hope that you do continue to be a part of these conversations because we will continue to have these conversations. Um, and finally, a big thanks to all of the Ukrainian research institutes across multiple continents that have come together to bring us together. Um, and we hope that you all stay safe and start, try to be happy in these really interesting times we're living in. Thank you.